Oh yeah, I think this is going to be really, really good. Aloha friends, my name is Matthew Gray and welcome to another tantalizing episode of 50 Tastes of Gray. Stimulating and engaging conversation with everything in life worth loving. Good combo, right? As always, I'll be your culinary guide today. My guest on today's show is equally at home, behind a stove or in front of a camera. He's a YouTube titan, gastronomic historian, with a sprinkle of wit, a splash of imagination, and a generous helping of zeal. He's whipped up loyal YouTube following of two and a half million subscribers. That's a good two and a half million more than I have. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to get your aprons on because this could get messy. And Max Miller is here today from Tasting History with Max Miller. He's been transforming history into a delectable feast for all of us. From the magic of Disney where Max once worked to the sizzling pans of YouTube, Max's journey is as rich and varied as his father's legendary Tycho chicken, one of Max's favorites. We'll be carving into his artistic roots, getting up close and personal, serving up slices of nostalgia, and garnishing it all with Max's preferred pizza toppings. Any guesses? We're about to launch a gastronomic time machine, adventuring through the annals of history, one mouth-watering morsel at a time. We'll start the day with a fun 20 questions game. Everyone digs that. We'll start it off that way. So whether you're a gourmet guru, a chef like myself, a history enthusiast, or just simply a connoisseur of captivating tales, stay with us. We are plating up a buffet of narrative guaranteed to satiate each and everyone's appetite. This is all you can eat as far as good listening. And remember, here at 50 Tastes of Grey, we know that life is way too short and way too delicious to miss out on a chat cast such as this. Stay tuned now for the most delicious interview of Max Miller from Tasting History right here, right now. You want to do 20 questions or something like that? Let's do it. Okay. Wine or beer? Wine. What kind of wine is your favorite? Uh, we have Max Miller on from Tasting History with Max Miller. What are your favorite pizza toppings? Ham, pineapple, and black olives. What would be at your last meal if you were to choose? Oh, boy. Probably a big old rack of barbecued ribs, barbecued baked beans, and... Uh, and uh, chocolate pie, chocolate ice cream, actually, probably. When you think of barbecue, are you thinking about the sticky, sweet, tomato-based, gooey, yeah. gooey, gooey? Yeah, yeah that same, same here. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I like, I like like a dry rub, but no, give me slathering with, you know, thick, sickly sweet sauce any day. Oh, yeah. Uh, what is your favorite fruit? Ooh, my favorite fruit. I'd probably say pineapple. Even though it gives me heartburn, I don't care. It's delicious. Did you try the fruit here in Hawaii, the, the pineapple that has oh. no acidity? Yeah, I have. And, and that's actually one of the things that's going to turn me on to it because I can eat it ad nauseum. And it's just so much sweeter over there than what we get here. What famous person have you been told throughout your life that you kind of look like or resemble somewhat? Oh, I've gotten Patrick Wilson when I was younger. Not so much anymore. Uh, and I often get, oh gosh, I can't remember his name. He's on Saturday Night Live or used to be back in like the early thousands. Can't remember. But if people look me up, they'll be like, oh yeah, I see it. I don't oh, know who have... it is. When is the last time you Googled yourself? Um, it was probably around the start of the book tour because I had to give people like a little blurb to say. And I was like, well, gosh, what have I done? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. You know, other people write, write stuff down. I don't, I don't ever remember what I've done. Name an old time favorite candy bar of yours. Old time. Yeah. I don't know. Well, How old well, is it? Snickers. Snickers. I mean, I guess that works. That's top of the line, isn't it? Yeah. Snickers and Baby Ruth are my two favorite candy bars. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 
briefs or boxers? Briefs. Boxer briefs, actually. Boxer briefs. <laughs> it's sort of like cutting it right in between there. <laughs> uh, fiction or nonfiction? Usually nonfiction. I like I both. Know. I would have figured that. Max Miller, thank you so much for joining me today on 50 Tastes of Grey. This is going to be a lot of fun. I'm so excited. Thank you for and, having me. You know, before the show, we were talking about our mutual love for kitty cats. What's your kitty cat's name? So we have two. Uh, they are named after Game of Thrones characters. We have Cersei and Jamie. And uh, if you know Game of Thrones, they take after their their namesakes. Cersei, I am afraid of, you know, will blow up the house one day just to wreak vengeance on us. And Jamie is just, he's so sweet, but just runs into danger. <laughs> and it's always picking a fight, even when he can't win it. But he's, he's wonderful. Is he kind of like your alter ego? I, you know what? I wish I had the courage that Jamie does. <laughs> it would be wonderful. Uh, he's, he's just the, the best. You know, every time I make contact with people, I like to ask them this first question, and that is, what have you eaten today? What have I eaten today? Well, I am I'm currently on a, on a bit of a diet, so uh, I've had two protein shakes and um, a chicken salad. Oh, okay. Now, are you letting down millions of people by saying you're on a diet? Because does that jive with everything that you and I are all about, the whole food world? No, you know, it's all about moderation. And uh. some days you got to, if, if some days I want to eat a bunch of ice cream and cakes and uh, I just ate a dozen fried oysters the other night and oh. all of these things, um, then, you know, on certain days you, you got to be good. Everything in moderation, even excess, is okay. Yes. And, you know, the only time I find dieting to, to lose weight is, is even plausible in my life is during the summer. I just, I tend not to do as much. I'm at home working on episodes constantly. Um, and so it's just easier to have, have some control over what I'm eating. Because basically from September until... May, I'm traveling or going out or going to parties and, you know, and then of course, all the food that I make on the channel I'm eating. So this is the time to, to be temperate. Oh, so summertime is your like mellow kickback, take care of Max self. Yes. Yeah. Oh. You know, we have a lovely pool and just hang out and try not to do a lot of traveling during the summer because everybody else is traveling and we have the freedom to travel at the times when other people aren't. So my travel season, you know, we go on vacation in late September, October and February, the times where it's not as busy. Now you were in my neck of the woods, weren't you last year getting married? Uh, so getting married two years ago, two years. um, Last year, we were also there, though, for our one-year anniversary. We go to Hawaii a lot, uh, but different islands. So two years ago, we got married on Oahu and then did the honeymoon in Maui. Last year, we were on the big island. When you came here to Oahu, did you get married at the Kahala Hotel or Kahala Resort? Was that where you were? No, we had uh, we went on the beach. It was it was real small, you know, fifteen minutes. Uh, not not a big deal. Saved saved a lot of money because getting married at the hotels is pretty pretty pricey. Oh yeah, you bet, <laughs> absolutely. Um, yeah, and you know when we got married, they were still having a lot of rules around COVID. So, you know, if you wanted to get married in a hotel or or any of the venues, you were kind of limited in how many people you could you could have. And we didn't have that many. It was only 25, but some of the venues were like 15. So um, we got married on the beach. It was beautiful. And um, yeah. Well, things are much more mellow now post-COVID, but I'm glad you brought that up just for a moment because I wanted to personally thank you for being there for me and I'm sure for millions of other people who watch Tasting History with Max Miller during the COVID time, because a lot of us were just wearing our sweatpants, sitting on the couch and watching YouTube. And there you were taking care of us. Thank you. It, it took care of me. I was sitting there on the couch wearing sweatpants, writing episodes. And I would have just sat on the couch wearing sweatpants the entire time had I not had this show to, to keep me busy and have something to, 
to focus on and look forward to. Tell us a little bit about tasting history with Max Miller. So for the one or two people in the audience who are watching who are maybe not familiar, could you tell us a little bit about the genesis of that? Yeah, so it started, it actually started a couple weeks before COVID hit. I worked at Disney, Walt Disney Studios, and I had been missing something creative to do because the job that I was in was just in, intense. And so I actually ended up switching jobs to have some more time to, to pursue something. What that something was, I wasn't sure until a friend at work said, hey, you know how you're always bringing us baked goods and giving us lectures on the history of the croissant and the Battenberg cake? Why don't you put that online? That can be your creative outlet. And so I did. Uh, that was Christmas of 2019, and I put out the first video at the end of February 2019. And so it's you know, baking, and it started out just baking, but uh, quickly turned into cooking of all kinds and talking about the history of, of whatever I'm making. Were you always that person in your life that people looked forward to having you at their homes because you'd always bring the greatest munchies and snacks and goodies? No. Um, so I didn't start, I, I didn't even go in a kitchen until... I think it was probably 2014. Wow. Uh, you know, I had lived in New York and boy, if you're going to cook in a New York apartment, you really have to be dedicated and love doing it. And I just, I, I had no desire. So I, I didn't. Uh, and then when I moved out to LA, it took me a few years before I found the great British bake off. And that was what actually inspired me to, to learn how to bake. And the reason that it inspired me was the history because they would talk about the history of what they were baking. And so it got me through the baking bug got me via history because uh, that's always been a passion of mine. And, and I have always been creative and, um, and have an insatiable need for uh, approval from others. And baking is a wonderful way to get that because <laughs> even when you mess up people, people like it. Uh, so, right. <laughs> um, so I, I, I quickly got better at it and, uh, and improved and, you know, used my, used my, mostly my, my work colleagues as, as my guinea pigs, I would bake all weekend and then bring it in on Monday. Now that you're paying attention to things other than just baked goods, it appears to me, to my eye, and I'm, I'm a trained professional chef. It seems like you're super accomplished and that, you know, a lot about everything. And you're able to pull it off and actually create that in your kitchen. How comfortable was that transition for you? It's funny you say that. Um, I I feel like I'm like I'm not in a lot of ways. You know, I the knowledge side um, of of cooking. I think I've I, I've been a pretty quick study uh, thanks to some wonderful cookbooks out there by like Thomas Keller who not just writes wonderful recipes, but explains to you why, why they're wonderful recipes and, um, and the technique and everything. But I sometimes come across something and I'm like, oh, this is a technique that I've never tried. And I am clearly lacking in it. Frankly, my knife skills in general, I would love to just hire somebody to show me how to, to chop things very, very quickly. Um, but this last week I was making oysters and it was the first time in my life I have shucked an oyster. And, oh, let's see your um, hands, Max. <laughs> they're intact. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but, you know, it, it's a lot more difficult than it looks. Um, and not all of them are made easy, you know, or equal. Uh, I would shuck one. And I'd be like, oh, this is simple. And then the next one, I'm like, it's been five minutes and I haven't even got the darn knife in. <laughs> um, so and it, it made me appreciate that the video is actually on the oyster uh, craze of the 19th century in New York. And there were oyster men who could uh, shuck like 2,300 oysters in two hours without breaking a shell. And I'm like, I, I think my fastest one was about 30 seconds. And that was not the norm. It's a good <laughs> thing you're not doing instructionals or else, you know, you'd have to be recording uh, shucking hell. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, that's why my videos are not, you know, I always say that I'm more of a history show with cooking than a cooking show with history. I can, I can show people how to make a dish, but if you're looking to learn how to cook, 
my show is not the one to to watch. There are mm -hmm. far better places to to learn skills and and things like that. You know, I always like to go behind the scenes and find out a little bit about the personal stuff of our wonderful guests. And you are definitely right at the very top of one of my favorite YouTube celebrities. I wanted to ask you about your first name. Is Max short for Maxwell or Maximilian or Maximum or anything like that? So um, Max is short for Maxwell, but it's actually my middle name. Oh. Um, my, my first name is James, but I've never gone by it not a day in my life. So I, I've always gone by Max. Um, and yeah, it's short for Maxwell. Tell us a little bit about your history knowledge base and your desire to educate, inform, and entertain your guests and the camera when you're sitting there doing these things that you're doing. So I, I have loved history since I was, I mean, really since before I can remember, but kind of my first memories of loving history were sitting with my grandpa, um, who was, you know, in World War II and in, he was a farmer during the Great Depression or, or grew up on a farm, rather. His grandfather was the farmer, grew up on a farm in Missouri during the Great Depression. So he was just filled with stories and he was a great storyteller. Um, and so he would, he would be telling me these stories that I would have a visceral effect of from hearing about something that had happened not to me a long, long time ago. And when, when you're, you know, six, 1940 was a very, very long time ago. And that's how I learned that I can, if I tell myself the story of history in the way that my grandpa told me, I can evoke that uh, emotion, no matter what the history is, uh, mm -hmm. no matter what the story is. So even when I'm reading a very dry history book, in my mind, I can turn it into a, you know, a three act play. And because that's all that history is, it's, it's just stories. I've always enjoyed getting people to have that same love of history, especially when they don't know that they have that love of history. Because a lot of people say, oh, I don't like history, it's dry. And then you tell them, you know, something interesting and, and well-told story from history. And they're like, oh, well, I like that kind of history. Um, and all history can be that kind of history, I, I like to think. I come from a family of teachers. My mom was a humanities teacher and was so she was taking everything from history and uh, politics and art and poetry and literature and teaching through all of that. You would learn a culture and, and all of these things through the lens of something else that was more accessible, perhaps. And, and, you know, so lots and lots of different students could learn lots of different ways. They could learn their way through those classes. And that's that's kind of what I do with tasting history, not as well as my mom ever did, but, uh, you know, teaching history through food, getting, you know, that's that's the hook. And right. uh, it seems to be working. One of the best compliments I ever get is I don't like history. And yet my favorite part of your show is the history section or, you know, I forgot by the time you got to the end of the history section, I forgot you were making a, a dish. You're such a great storyteller, and that is so much different than having the knowledge in your head. How are you able to take the knowledge in your head and become this wonderful, I can connect with anybody kind of energy? I don't know. Um, I really don't know, because I, 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 I think that part of it is kind of knowing knowing an audience or, or having, having a specific audience. You know, I, I was in theater for years, and I studied playwriting. I was never a playwright, but I studied playwriting and um, and then later uh, novel writing. And one of the most important things is you're not going to be able to, to get to everyone. You can't your audience can't be everyone. You have to have a very specific audience. And so I have a very specific audience. Um, and it's my friend Maureen. Uh, now it's it's kind of moved away from that. Now I am actually my audience, so I just write, tell stories to entertain myself. <laughs> um, but when it started out, it was it was me thinking of okay, how would I tell Maureen this? Um, and and I think that that's the way to do it because you can imagine the responses and 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 it helps you get timing and 
And it is all about, you know, just threading things together, but but linking them. It can't just be a bunch of facts. It needs to be a bunch of facts linked together, and you can craft a story that way. Uh, and sometimes it's easier than others, but um, I, sometimes I enjoy the the hard ones. You know, when I'm writing something, I'm like, I have seven pages of stuff that does not really mesh together and then i get to come up with the story of how to to bring it together and often i do that by saying okay this episode is going to be me telling you how your day would be if you were a peasant in ancient greece or if you were a medieval guest at a banquet you know and then i can take all those facts and kind of string them together because I'm just recreating your day. Um, so that, that, yeah, that's the long answer. So you translate all of this wonderful history and then you just make it your own by way of the script and then you do your performance and intercut all of the actual presentation of the foods during your shows. Yeah. Wow. You talk about history a lot. In what time frame or time period would you go back to if you had an opportunity to go and visit? Hard to decide. I think that it would be England in uh -huh. just before Napoleon came came around. You know, things didn't go so well for a few years with with him raging. But uh, England in like the 1790s, just you know that Jane Austen era. I, I love the clothes. The food is fascinating. The politics is fascinating. Um, you know, it's it's a time when. Uh, and this, of course, is if if I'm wealthy, because I don't really want to go to any point in time <laughs> if I'm not wealthy. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Anyone who wasn't wealthy just didn't really have a good time for most of history. But um, I, assuming I'm wealthy, I think that's the time I'd go to. So were you pretty blown away that your YouTube channel has taken off and become so extremely successful in the course of just a few years? I'm shocked by it, honestly. Mainly because I, when I started it, I was like, "This first of all, doing YouTube is, YouTube is not easy. Uh, there's there's just a lot of competition out there, and it is a constant grind putting out an episode every single week." Um, and the topic that I chose was was pretty niche historical cooking. I was like, very very surprised. Yeah, it's pretty mind blowing. Really fantastic. What's your favorite Thanksgiving dish? Sweet potatoes. And how do you how do you prepare those? Um, honestly, I like sweet potatoes absolutely anyway, even with marshmallows, because that's how my grandma used to make it. But I prefer. I used to work at Ruth's Chris Steakhouse in college, uh -huh. and they do a wonderful sweet potato. And I say sweet potato; it's almost always yams. Um, you know, nobody ever actually eats sweet potatoes, so it's it's done with brown sugar and butter and, and cinnamon and everything, but it's like a crust on the top of, of this, of the sweet potato. So it's more like a casserole. That's So that's the way that I typically do it. You know, Ruth's Chris, funny that you bring that up because that was a place that I'd go to when I was younger and I would just get the sides, let the people eat the mm -hmm. steak and I would have all the side dishes because they were so yeah. awesome. Yeah, they're fantastic. You know, I, I don't mind their steak either. <laughs> Oh, yeah, right. Exactly. I wanted to congratulate you on your brand new book. Can you tell us a little bit about how long that took, the name of the book, and how well it's doing? Yeah, so it's called Tasting History. Um, it's It has took quite some time to write, oh, yeah. uh, lo longer than I had expected. Um, just the, the process in general, because even when you're done writing a book, it's a year before it's actually on shelves because you've got the photography and the editing and then the, you know, the, the layout and the printing and just, it's, it's a much longer process than I expected, but, uh, the, the response has been wonderful. You know, we, uh, New York times bestseller and the, by far the most exciting thing for me has been the in-person book signings because, YouTube is so insulated. Uh, right. I mean, I'm I'm here in my office right now, and I rarely leave my office except to go to the kitchen when I film stuff, and and back. So I never really meet anyone who watches the show, 
And if I do, it's just one person here and one person there. So um, having 500 people or so in a room at once who watch the show and know the things that I make and and everything and know stuff about my life, it's it's amazing. Just absolutely fantastic. 500 people in person is more impactful than a million people online, I've found. Well, yeah. Oh, that that kind of energy just must be mind-blowing for you. Yeah. I mean, it reminds me of when I was... I did live theater in New York and, and that same feeling, that kind of electricity between uh, a big group of people and yourself. And, and I definitely miss that. When you're doing the circuit for your book tour, have you had any interesting or funny or very special encounters that stuck with you? A lot, actually. They go by so quickly, you know, is, is, the, is the, the problem. Um, but there have been so many people have brought me some wonderful wonderful things and uh, just little anecdotes and whatnot. But one one thing that stuck with me was at one of the very first signings that I had, somebody stood up and said, you know, I've been watching you since you you made Garum and you, you had me at Garum. And uh. I just loved that phrase so much. And and because 90% of the audience agreed because that's that was their entrance into the the show as well. And so the, I ended up putting it on a T-shirt, making T-shirts that said, you had me at Garum because it just, it really impacted me. And, you know, that episode changed my life forever. And just to know that it um, had an impact on so many people is, is really rewarding. It's uh, an awesome and obscure and fantastic reference to tasting history. Tell people who might not know what Garum is, what it is. Yeah, so it's often called the fermented fish sauce of ancient Rome, but really it's not fermented as much as digested. I currently have a jar digesting in my in my backyard. Um, it's basically fish, whole fish, typically. There are lots of ways to make it, but it's typically whole fish um, with all of their, the things that you would typically take out when you gut a fish, you leave in, and salt. And that's it. Uh, they can you can put herbs and wine and other things in, but those are the two must-haves. And then you just leave it to digest itself, and the salt keeps it from you know getting botulism or spoiling. So it's I've had mine sitting out there now for two weeks in the hot Southern California sun, and just smells like a fish market. I would have thought that it would have smelled horrific by now and it just doesn't it doesn't um, rot does it it's it's sort of like a lactobacillus fermentation even though you're calling it digestion can you explain what that difference is because i don't know <clears throat> that. well so it's not it's 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 a different it's just a different process like uh it doesn't give off gas like huh. like if it was being fermented it would you know ha you'd have bubbles and foam on yeah. the top and everything it has not none of that there's none of that so it's it's the enzymes that were in the fish's gut that are digesting the rest of the fish. It's really actually quite morbid, but um, <laughs> rather than some sort of bacteria that has been introduced to to do the breaking down, it's these digestive different enzymes. I'm, I'm not entirely sure what the science is. I'm still working on it. There's a wonderful book called The Story of Garum by Sally Granger, who is like, the queen of garum she's been studying it for years and um i'm i'm part way through the book and i haven't gotten to the part exactly where it explains all of all of what it is and the difference between a typical fer fermentation and what is going on in my backyard right now <laughs> what is going uh, because on? there is no there is no worry that it's going to explode i mean granted you have to stir it so i'm always taking the lid off and everything but you know, I made fermented beets, uh, kvass, just a few months ago, and within a day, it was there was bubbling, and if I had left the lid on, it would have exploded in right. a couple of days. Right. Not this. Uh, this there's there's really, if there is any gas, it's such a small amount that it's unnoticeable. Is um, the but yeah. it, it's a wonderful flavor, not what it is right now, but eventually it will be a wonderful flavor, and is still used in different forms in a lot of Asian cooking. Um, and it, you know, even Worcestershire sauce 
has an element of this type of, of fish in it. Uh, so it's still around with us, just not as popular as it was in ancient Rome. Right, right. But like you said, in, in Asian cuisine, fish sauce is, is really popular. Could you explain the difference in, as far as the flavor profile goes between garum and a traditional Filipino or Thai fish sauce? So the, the garum or the, the liquid actually is just called liquamen, but um, there are many ways of making it. So it can be different fish, it can be different herbs and everything. So the flavor profile changes based on what you're doing. And it's the same with Asian fish sauces. They use different fish. They'll add, sometimes they'll add sugar. Sometimes they'll add chilies. Sometimes they'll add nothing. One big difference is the sodium amount. If you look at the fish sauces of, of Asia today, they typically have between 25 and 30% sodium levels. It's really, really high. Right. In all of the recipes that we have from ancient Rome and rather Byzantium, they are about 12.5% to 15% uh, sodium. So it's much, much lower. It's high enough that botulism won't grow, but it's going to be a lot less salty than, than the Asian fish sauces. Right. At that level, nothing's going to grow in that. Yeah. No, yeah. I mean, there's, I, 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 off the top of my head, I can't tell i can't remember i think it's like eight percent sodium uh and botulism won't grow and in, in that um maybe it's 10 percent. but this is 12 and a half to, to 15 percent you actually have to be pretty specific when you're making it and even more specific if you end up having to add liquid that's why i've put the lid on it so i'm not having a lot of um evaporation because yeah. if it is evaporating you have to add other things in ancient rome sometimes it would have been water sometimes it would have been wine but either way you have to turn that liquid into a brine that is the same salinity sal salinity is that the word uh -huh. um as what you're putting it into otherwise you'll dilute it to the point where you might drop below that threshold where bacteria can start growing Oh, okay. So it sounds like it gets complicated at some point down the line. How long will the garum go in the in your Southern California backyard before you're ready to like whip it out and start to enjoy cooking with it? Yeah. So hopefully it won't get that complicated for me because I am leaving the lid on because I don't want to have to add any liquid. The recipe says two months. Um, now this is a, you know, 2000 year old or 1500 year old recipe. So it's, it's not, spot on and uh so but you can leave it longer you can in asian fish sauces often they'll leave it for a year or years to continue to go but you really can leave it until everything is turned to liquid that's that's kind of what you're looking for it's not going to do that in two months it will take longer to do that right. uh simply from other people you know kind of testing it um but already after just two weeks it's it's very, very liquid, which is amazing because you don't add any liquid at the beginning. It's literally just the fish mm -hmm. and salt. It's only solids that you're putting in there. And now it's 75% liquid and then the rest is fish bones. Um, so eventually, once it's mostly liquid, probably at about two, two and a half months, it can be strained over and over very, very slowly through a super, super fine strainer. And what is now brown muck that really just looks like garbage water uh, will become a somewhat clear amber liquid. And and that's what you're looking for. And that's the liquamen. Everything that is left is called alika. And they used to actually use, and it's kind of just the sludge at the bottom, and they used to use that to eat as well. They would smear it on bread with cheese and uh, it was it was thought to be quite good. There's no way I'm going to eat. I'm not going to try that. You, you just can't pay, be paid enough uh, to try the sludge at the bottom, but the Romans liked it. People eat Vegemite and Marmite. <laughs> at least you tried it. You know what's so, it's so great about watching it is that you know how some children's cartoons or animation that is meant for younger minds has some adult material kind of built in between the lines. Oh yes. When I watch your show and you're communicating with us and to us, 
there's a little bit of sass and sauce in your style and delivery and uh, between the lines. Is that something by design? Or is that just your personality kind of coming out? A little bit of both. I mean, that's uh-huh. my personality coming out, but I, I make sure to, to introduce that. In the first episodes, I, um, I made a conscious effort to, to remove that stuff for the most part. Um, and because I, I, I felt, you know, at, at the beginning, I was like, I want this very educational and, you know, highbrow. Um, I, I still think I'm pretty highbrow, but uh, right. I quickly realized that people enjoyed that. I mean, that's that's the difference between YouTube and traditional, most traditional media is it is YouTube. It's all about you, the presenter. And you have this connection with the audience that you don't have from from regular t- television. And so if you're going to have that connection, you you might as well just be the real you and and put all of your your, your stuff in there as well. And, you know, sometimes I'm like, well, but it's, does it come across as biased against or towards something or anything? And then I'm, you know, I'm like, well, maybe, but I'm not a history professor. I'm not a historian. I'm not trying to give you the exact, you know, this is my, the unbiased opinion. It's, this is a cool story from history and this is what I think of it. And if, you know, that's just how it is. And that's why I, and I get to lean on stories that most historians have to eschew because, you know, they can't use things like Pliny the Elder and uh, Philip Thinkneys and all these wonderful writers because they were so over the top, not just biased, but flowery in their language or outright making stuff up, Herodotus, you know, (laughs) it's just crazy. Um, but they're part of history. And so that's the history that I like to tell is the interesting parts with the caveat that, no, the the Celts were not actually all <laughs> barbarian cannibals like some people wrote about them. But boy, isn't it interesting that they thought that? So You don't really have to self-regulate very much. Then you can just kind of let it rip and, and uh, you don't have to do any disclaimers because it's all being filtered through your eyes and mind. Yeah. Yeah. For the most part, you know, I mean, often I'll throw in disclaimers of like, you know, you got to take that with a grain of salt or this person, his grandfather was murdered by this emperor. So what he's writing about him might not be the most fair portrayal. But as long as I let people know that, then it's that's how it is. You know, you just use the term grain of salt. Take that with a grain of salt. Are there any other food idioms that come to mind for you? Gosh, there there are so many. Um, right. I, and it's coming off the top of my head, though. It, what's funny is whenever I mention, whenever I say grain of salt, and sometimes I I get people saying, "Oh, it's pinch of salt." So I, it seems that people say some people say pinch, some people say grain, and they're very very uh, strong opinioned about which which one is right. Um, it's not exactly a piece of cake to determine what not kind a of salt of it cake. is. <laughs> Let the meat cake, indeed. Um, right. There are so many out there. And I think that the reason that there are so many is because everybody eats and it's something that everyone can relate to. So very quickly, you, you know what people mean by a lot of these idioms and they're, you know, in all languages and cultures and everything. And that's why I think one reason why I do think that the show has been so successful is because everybody has food. Everyone is curious about food. And when I cover food that is particular to their culture or a story that they know, there's there's this sense of ownership of of like, you know, pride in in whatever their their cuisine is. When you talk about food, it's really hitting people in their previous life or their early childhood that, you know, food and memories and and love and everything like that seems to be connected. And you know this when you're communicating your storyline. Yeah. You know, food and music are are two of those things that you immediately associate a memory with them. And it's often from early childhood. And that's why, you know, even if it's not the the best food or the fanciest food or whatever, boy, a certain dish can have such such an effect on a person, you know, 
a peanut butter and jelly sandwich made exactly the way that your mom made it or macaroni and cheese that you used to eat every time you went over to this friend's house when you were a little kid can have a more visceral effect. And so you will like it more than a dish from, a, you know, two Michelin star, three Michelin star restaurants. Because right. you don't have, it is all about the taste and the presentation with that. You don't have any preconceived emotions tied to, to new foods, but you do to those old foods. When they'll do taste tests of sodas or, or ketchups or things like that, it's the, the person's favorite is whatever they grew up on. Right. Because, right. because that's what they know. And music is the same way. You know, we, we often think of, the best music that has ever been written tends to have been the music that was popular when we were in our teens and early 20s, when we were young and healthy and spry and didn't have all that many cares in the world. And then by the time you get to 40, it's like, oh, the music of the kids today is terrible. Right, and it's like, right. well, it'll be the same because you have memories. I have memories tied to REM and, you know, the crash test dummies. <laughs> crash test dummies aren't the best music ever. But boy, I sure remember driving down the street with my mom and my dad in the car listening to, to some of their music or whatever. It's the same with food. So I know you never want to judge someone's taste in music and food because you don't know the emotions that are tied to that. And uh, yeah, I think that people take great offense when you when you question their taste in those two two fields. Oh yeah, it's absolutely personal because if someone likes food, everyone seems to determine what they like. Some people go to McDonald's and if they like McDonald's, McDonald's is their food. You know, it's a, who yeah. am I to judge them? And if someone likes very erudite, very high end, very high brow type stuff, that's fine. That's the food that they like. It doesn't mean that you and I have to love it, right? Exactly. They say a lot of our connections to memory and feelings in childhood have to do with emotional references to things. So Music, like you said, the crash test dummies, you really liked them when you were growing up, probably because there was a lot of emotion tied in with listening to them, as there may have been with whatever special favorite foods you had when you were a child. Yeah. No, it's, I mean, emotions and, and sometimes very specific memories are, are tied to so many flavors and, and sounds and scents uh, as well. But food, I, I do find to be the most the most overwhelming um, and just can like trans it's like that scene in Ratatouille oh. where the, the, the food critic takes that bite of Ratatouille and it's the simplest dish. And yet it reminds him of, you know, walking in on his mom cooking in on a summer day. And it's just like that. Everybody knows that experience when you take a bite of something and you weren't expecting it, especially, sometimes it'll bring up a memory that you didn't even remember that you had. And it is it is the most overwhelming feeling and uh, kind of just always searching for that because it is a wonderful feeling. It is. You know, you smell something, you go, that's grandma's strudel or, yep. you know, just that kind of thing. So what are a few of those foods for you that, that when you think about some of the things that mom made, your grandma made, what come to mind for you? So one is, uh, it's a Japanese style fried chicken that my dad actually makes. And he used to make it when we were kids only for special occasions because it's a lot of work. And so, you know, birthdays or graduations, things like that. Still to this day, I go home to Phoenix on my birthday. And I'm like, you're, you're making taiko chicken, right? Because that's, that's what I need. Uh, so that's probably <laughs> one of the strongest. Another one is actually uh, Baskin and Robbins peanut butter and chocolate ice cream. And it has to be Baskin and Robbins because right. they would freeze the, the, the peanut butter chunks are frozen to such an extreme that it almost hurts to bite into them. And they're wonderful, but I used to always get that. We would go to Baskin and Robbins after 
a play that I was in or a concert that I did, you know, when I was in middle school and elementary school after a particularly good sporting event, which I was terrible at sports. So that was a rarity. Um, and so <laughs> that I, you know, whenever I taste that ice cream, cause it hasn't really changed in, in 30 years. When I taste that ice cream, I'm, I'm the star of the show again, <laughs> you know, it's like, yay, I had a very good night and everybody came to see me, even if it's just me eating a tub of it in front of my TV alone. <laughs> it's the, it's the emotion that's tied to it. So to this day, that ice cream is still your go-to ice cream if you just want to self-comfort yourself. Yeah. I mean, uh -huh. I, it's, it's hard to, hard to get the one at the store is not the same as the one that they actually have at the shops. So you have to go to the, to the shop oh. to get the one that, that I feel, uh, that's like super over frozen <laughs> peanut butter. Oh, um, wow. and, uh, so it's, it, it's a rarity. I'd say once a year I end up having it and, and it's always a treat. Max, I was going to ask you if you ever suffer from what I experience and I call it diner's remorse. And that is the experience I go through when I, go to a restaurant, pay a fair amount of money, as you know, and then say, oh, this isn't so good. I can make it way better at home. So is that something you've ever experienced? And how do you deal with that? Oh, yeah. Usually I just go to a different restaurant the next time. And I'm like, oh, tried that. You know, moving on. Um, often I find that it happens at restaurants that have been hyped up, you know, and you build it up in your mind or whatever. Um, though then there's the, the opposite. We went to a restaurant in, in Phoenix where I think it was in Scottsdale, but, uh, where I, my, my sister had hyped up this dish that they had there. And then I tried it and I was like, oh, okay, it's fine. It's not great. It's fine. And, and it was a really expensive restaurant. But then my brother and I decided, you know what? This is my 40th birthday. Let's buy and share because we're not crazy. This $200 steak that they had. Um, and now I can't remember the, the name of the cut, but it's a cut that most butchers don't even don't even get. They, they only go to these fancy restaurants. And uh, it's the best thing that I've ever it's one of the best foods that I've ever had this this steak. So, you know, now I'll remember that restaurant for that as opposed to the, the slightly disappointing appetizer. I can't even remember what it was because right, I remember just put that, that out of your mind. <laughs> exactly. Have you ever experienced molecular gastronomy? And if so, where, where was it? And what did you think of it from, from a cook's perspective? You know, I did. Uh, and I can't remember now where it was. It was when I lived in New York, when molecular gastronomy was, was, I don't know if it was in its infancy, but this was probably like 2009, 2010. So it was quite a while ago. Right. Um, and I'm not going to lie. I wasn't, I wasn't. Pretty um, you were just saying that you, you were having thoughts about molecular gastronomy. You didn't really love it very much. Yeah. I mean, I don't remember being, I don't remember being wowed by it. And I remember being wowed by the price more than the experience. Right. Same here. <laughs> I did discover a molecular place in Barcelona and uh, it then became a Michelin starred place. And it was, you know, quite an experience, very theatrical. But as far as the whole food satisfaction thing, maybe not. I'm actually making a concerted effort. We just finished the show, The Bear. I'm not sure if you watched it. Oh, yeah. Um, it, and but it made me want to visit more Michelin star restaurants and, and kind of try more of that very fine dining uh, stuff. So maybe, maybe my, my mind will be changed. Okay. Keep our fingers crossed on that. Now, as far as your audience goes, are you really thrilled with the, the demographic and that, that high brown nature of the people who watch you for the most part? Oh yeah. I, I have found one thing I found, especially with the book tour is <clears throat> my audience is really smart. Um, which is a, just, you know, kind of a compliment to me. Um, I have always found that it's, it's a much younger audience. Um, you know, I'm, I'm on the old side of my, <laughs> of my audience. Uh -huh. Most people are in their twenties and thirties. Um, but part of that's just this YouTube in general, but it's a heavily skewing male audience too, which I was uh, surprised about, not necessarily good or bad, just surprised. Were you more surprised about the age of your audience versus the gender? 
both. I thought it, I thought they would be older, and I thought it would be more of a 50-50 split, I guess. Or I never really thought about it. And on some videos, it's you know 80% male, 20% female. And I'm, I'm always like, why is that? Um, and I have no explanation. Yeah, I have no explanation, and there's no way to figure that one out, is there? Not really. Um, you know, I mean, sometimes I can look at a specific topic and, and it'll skew a little a little less strongly male. It might be 70 percent male and 30 percent female. Um, but in, in general, history based shows do typically have a stronger male audience. I'm just not quite sure why, but that is it, it's not untypical. What one sentence would you leave for future generations that would contain the most information in the fewest words? <laughs> Off the top of my head? <laughs> sure, why not? <laughs> um, boy. Stop trying to entertain people and entertain yourself. Beautiful, man. That was fantastic. How much time are you spending on each shoot, each show that you're putting out? How much time is cooking? How much food do you make? How many retakes do you have to do? So it, it really varies. Uh, it can be, it's usually between 30 and 45 hours per episode. Sometimes it's a little bit more, uh, especially if it's like an Asian cuisine that I, I require just more um, laborious uh, research and and stuff that's that's where the most of the time goes is in the research and the writing the cooking can take anywhere from three hours to to 10 hours basically whatever it is that i'm cooking if it would take you an hour to cook it will take me six hours to cook uh, yeah, because yeah. of the filming aspect and having to move things around and making mistakes and covering those up and uh, redoing, redoing things. Cause I never make the same thing. We've been through the internet wars together, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Can you hear me? All right. Yeah. Yeah. This is yeah. just before that my phone gives up too. <laughs> this is the first time this has happened. Maybe we should just wrap it up and, uh, and we'll see each other in brighter future. Sounds good. Sounds good. Max Miller, you are a real inspiration for those of us who love food, love education, love entertainment. You have brought it all together and you really had made something very special for yourself. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. And next time I am uh, in Hawaii, possibly for Spam Jam next, next spring, uh, we'll have to get together. I'll make you my uh, famous Mai Tai and uh, we'll go from there. It's called The Kiss. Excellent. I'll yeah. take it. Thanks once again for visiting me here on 50 Tastes of Grey, Max. We'll, we'll connect soon. Aloha. Aloha. Thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.